Hello, welcome to lecture 10 of Electrical Circuits 1. In this lecture, I want to start talking about signals and systems, okay? We're going to talk about linear systems and what is called superposition, and also Thevenin and Norton's theorems. We're going to cover a lot of ground in this lecture. So there are a number of new topics that we're going to introduce here. I'm going to introduce them very briefly, give us a little bit of background and some terminology and vocabulary. My main goal is to get on to Thevenin and Norton's theorems as quickly as possible. They rely on at least some exposure to these topics. Now, we will be going back and using these more later in the semester, but I'm just going to talk about them very briefly here. If you want to read more detailed stuff, sections 1.7.0 through 1.7.4 cover these topics. In lecture one, we claimed that it would eventually be convenient for us to represent physical devices as systems. So now we're going to start representing electrical circuits as systems. So a quick review on what I was talking about in lecture one. Okay. Our system is a mathematical representation of some physical device. We think of the physical device as having some input, which I'll typically call u of t, and some output y of t. Now, we're going to start thinking of this physical device as more of a black box which has been replaced with some mathematical relationship between y of t and u of t. So y of t is going to be some function of u of t. We'll start thinking of this system in terms of this functional relationship. Our inputs and outputs can be whatever we choose them to be. For example, the input could be some applied voltage source. The output could be some current through a resistor somewhere or some voltage across a resistor. Okay? You kind of get to define what your inputs and outputs are when you're modeling the circuit as a system. Okay, so we define the inputs and outputs when we do the circuit representation as a system. In general, our inputs, u of t and y of t, will be functions of time. So far, any inputs, voltages or currents, we've applied to our circuit with voltage sources or current sources have just been constant values. A constant value is a special case of a function that varies with time. Later on, we'll start introducing time-varying functions. Typically, these will be time-varying, and we will call them signals. So we have some signal applied to the system, and we get some other signal out of the system. OK, I claim that we're kind of changing our point of view now. OK, we're thinking about circuits as systems. So what's the difference between the way we were looking at them before for the first nine lectures and the way we're looking at them now? Well, always before, our voltage sources and current sources, anything applied to the circuit from its outside environment, have just been some specific value. For example, I could have some circuit like this, which is just a series combination of resistors with some voltage source, and I could say I want to determine the current I. Okay, well the current by Ohm's law is just the total voltage divided by the equivalent resistance. Series combinations of resistors add, so the current is the total voltage, 24 volts, over 30 ohms, which is 0.8 amps. We put a specific number into this, we get a specific number out. If we change this number, we have to redo the analysis to get this number, right? Now, when we're doing a systems level approach of the same type of problem, we're going to kind of redefine this circuit in terms of an input and an output. My input is now going to be some general number. It may still have a voltage source, but I'm going to give that an arbitrary value, Vm. I don't necessarily know what this voltage is at this stage. And I still am interested in the current through here. So I'm rethinking about this circuit as some input with some output. Okay. Now, my current is still the total voltage over the total resistance, Vn over 30 ohms, but now I don't have a specific number for Vn. This relationship is good for any number that I put in here as Vn. 
Okay, so for example, now I'm looking at this as some input voltage. It's applied to some circuit, gives me an output current. So the output current is just 1 over 30 times Vn. So whatever I give it as Vn, I divide that by 30, that's my current. Right? I'm not restricted to a particular voltage value. So I can just say arbitrarily after the fact, I want to apply 10 volts across here. What's my current? Well, it's a piece of cake, one third of an amp. Okay. If I want to do my previous value of 24 volts, just put that here, 0.8 amps. Okay. I don't have to redo the analysis if I change this number. Now in this class, I'm going to restrict my attention to what are called linear systems. And in lecture one, I very superficially introduced the concept of linear systems. I said essentially that they have linear relationships between dependent variables. If I plot one dependent variable against another, I get a straight line. We want to formalize that definition a little bit more. Okay? So what I'm going to claim is if I have some linear system and I apply some input x1 of t to that and get some output y1 of t to that, Okay, that's one test that I can run. Okay, I put this input in, get this output out. Now I take the same system, I apply a different input to that, I get some different output. Okay, so now I apply x2 of t and I get y of 2 of t out of the same system. Now if this system is linear, the following holds. My output of a linear system to some combination of these inputs can be determined directly without reanalyzing the system. So for example, if I just apply alpha x1 of t to this linear system, I'll get alpha times y1 of t out. Okay? If I put 2 volts into this and get 6 volts out, then if I put 4 volts in, I'll get 12 volts out. They scale directly if I put a multiplicative factor on the input. Likewise, if I combine these two inputs, say alpha and beta are both 1, and this particular notation indicates that I'm adding up these signals and applying them to this system, so I'm applying x1 of t plus x2 of t to the system, my output of the system is going to be y1 of t plus y2 of t. So if I add these two inputs together and apply them at the same time, my output's going to be the sum of the individual outputs. Another quick example of a linear system. Back in lecture two, we introduced very briefly dependent sources. Okay? Those are commonly considered to be linear systems, at least the ones that we will be concerned about in this class. So for example, if I have some voltage controlled voltage source, in which I'm taking a voltage here and putting a voltage out over here, which is k times this voltage, I can very readily think of this as a system. I can think of this applied voltage, V1, as my input. My system is creating an output from that, the voltage across these terminals, by simply multiplying the input voltage by k. This notation here simply means that I'm going to take this number, k, multiply it by v1 to get the output. Later on, we'll start referring to this as a gain value. There's a gain between the input and the output. The gain value is k. Let's take a slightly more complicated circuit and look at that as a system. Okay, I've got this system here, and I'll start introducing dependent sources now on and off. So I'm going to put a dependent source here. So I've got a voltage-controlled current source. The current put out by this dependent source is just three times the voltage across this 5-ohm resistor. So if I wanted to, I could think of this particular device here as a system in and of itself. I'm also going to take a look at the overall circuit as a system. Okay, I'm going to apply some voltage in here, and my voltage across the 5 ohm resistor is going to be my output voltage. So you can combine your systems. I can have one system inside another, which makes things extremely convenient for me if I want to design different parts of the system at different times or assign the different design parts of the system to different people. 
Now, I think I decided to use mesh analysis on this rather arbitrarily. So if I short this, this is a current source. It opens circuits. I end up with two mesh loops, I1 and I2. This voltage controlled current source, like any other current source, requires a constrained loop. So I have a constraint current here that's three times Vx. My constrained current matches the magnitude and direction of the current source that it's going through. Now if I apply KVL around I1, I get four times I1 plus two times I1 minus three times V sub X plus Vn. We should have had a lot of practice on this uh, in lectures 9 and 10. I now need to loop around I2. Starting down here, I get a negative Vn plus 3 ohms times I2 minus 3 times Vx plus 5 ohms times the current going through that is just I2. Now I still have three unknowns, V sub X, I1, one and I2 are all unknown. However, I have a constraint that V sub X is 5 times I2. I now have three equations in three unknowns. I can solve those for V sub X. And what I'm going to do is claim that Vn counts as a known. Okay, I don't have a specific value for it, but in order to analyze this circuit, I need to know what Vn is. Okay, so this guy here does not count as an unknown in my circuit. You need to tell me what voltage you're going to apply before I can tell you what voltage is going to come out of here. If I solve these equations, I get V sub X is 5 sevenths times Vn. So this circuit is taking this input voltage, multiplying it by 5 sevenths, and getting this output voltage out, regardless of what number I put in for this. Now let's take a look at using the results of that previous analysis to determine our output for a couple of different rather arbitrarily chosen inputs. Remember on the previous slide I said V sub X was 5 sevenths times Vn. Now in part A, if Vn is 14 volts, V sub X is just 5 over 7 times 14 volts which is 10 volts. Easy. Now, suppose Vn is 5 times cosine of 3t minus 12e to the minus 2t. OK, fairly complicated signal. It doesn't matter. No matter what Vn is, Vx is 5 sevenths times what that is. So V sub x is 5 over 7 times the whole quantity 5 cosine of 3t minus 12e to the minus 2t. It can make your life very easy when you're checking to see what the result of different input values is, or if you don't know what your input is while you're creating your model. Maybe somebody has to tell you what the input is, and they still need to go figure that out. You can't always wait for them to decide what the input is before you analyze your circuit to determine what the output is going to be. Now I want to briefly talk about a circuit analysis technique called superposition. Superposition relies upon a special case of our previous definition of a linear system's response. I've eliminated my alphas and betas from the previous definition slide. So I'm applying x1 to some linear system and getting y1 out. Then I apply x2 to the same linear system and get y2 out. Now, if I sum up these inputs and apply those to the linear system, my output is just the sum of these two individual outputs. So transferring this back to the physical real world, if I have some circuit which behaves as a linear system, if that circuit has multiple inputs, if it has several different sources, what I can do is determine the response of the system to each source individually, and then add up all those responses to get the total overall response of the circuit. Sometimes that can be considerably easier than analyzing this overall circuit with all the sources included at the same time. 
Now let's look more specifically at how to do this in the context of a circuit analysis. If we have a circuit that has multiple sources, we're going to determine the response to each source. In order to determine that, what we're going to do is pick a source, we'll kill all the other sources. Okay? So any other voltage sources will be replaced by short circuits, any other current sources will be replaced by open circuits. Once I've killed those other sources, I analyze the circuit to determine the response to the one source that I left not dead. Okay. I repeat that process for every single source. I get an output response relative to each source. Then I add up all those contributions. Let's do an example next. I want to determine the current I for this circuit. And since I just introduced superposition, I'm going to use superposition techniques to do that. So the first thing I'm going to do is determine the I that would be induced by only this 2 volt source. So I'm going to keep this 2 volt source. OK, the 2 ohm resistor remains. The 4 ohm resistor remains. And I'm going to kill this source. This becomes an open circuit. This guy here, I'm going to call current I1. This guy is easy to analyze. I1 is just the total voltage over the total resistance. I1 is equal to 2 volts over 6 ohms, or 1 third of an amp. Now I'm going to repeat the process for this source. I'm going to retain this source, Okay, the 4 ohm resistor stays, the 2 ohm resistor stays, and the voltage source, once it is killed, gets replaced by a short circuit. This now looks like a current source in parallel with a parallel combination of resistors. This guy is a current divider. So this current, I2, which is the portion of the current I which is due to this current source, I2 is the other resistor, 2 ohms, over the sum of the two, 2 ohms plus 4 ohms, times the total current 1 amp, which is 2 over 6, or 1 third amp. Now the total current is just the sum of the contributions from each source. That is 1 third plus 1 third, which is 2 thirds amps. There are a lot of cases where this type of idea can make your life much simpler. Okay, now let's introduce yet some more terminology. And a lot of this stuff are concepts that we've already been introduced to. We're just introducing some formal terminology so that we can deal with them more easily and talk about them more easily. We're going to talk about next two terminal networks. It's sometimes convenient to represent our electrical circuits as two terminal networks. Okay. What this allows us to do is decouple different portions of the circuit, okay, analyze or design those different portions independently from one another, and then put them back together and have the overall circuit or system behave the way it's supposed to behave. Okay? So once you've taken a portion of a circuit which has two terminals, you can analyze or design that portion. Then when you hook it up with those terminals to something else, you're in good shape. Okay. This is a consistent view to the systems level view that I introduced earlier. Okay. The way you characterize these guys is by the voltage current relationships across the terminals. So you're looking at two terminals, you're looking at the voltage across the terminals, you're looking at the current into and out of the terminals. Those voltages and currents can be considered to be inputs and outputs from the two terminal network. Okay. So those voltages and currents at the terminals are going to be treated for us like inputs and outputs of a system. We've already been using two terminal networks a lot so far in this class. 
I want to give you some examples of what we've been doing so that you can place them in the context of this supposedly new concept. For example, a simple resistor. My resistor has two terminals. Okay? I can apply a voltage across this resistor and get some current through it, or I can apply some current into this resistor and get a voltage across it. Either way, the voltage and current are related by Ohm's law. V is equal to R times I. I can look at a simple single resistor as a system. Okay? If I think of the current as being the input and the voltage as being the output, V is R times I. Now, as I mentioned earlier, sometimes the choice of what you define as your inputs and outputs is kind of up to you. If you want to think of putting a current into this and getting a voltage out, that's fine. It may be more convenient to think in terms of applying a voltage across these terminals and getting some current as your output, in which case this relationship just says that I is equal to 1 over R times V. Either way, this system is described by its voltage current relationship at the terminals. Okay, the terminal voltages, the current into the terminal. So this particular circuit, its voltage current relation is simply a straight line passing through the origin. If I plot voltage on the vertical axis and current on the horizontal axis, the slope of that straight line is just the resistance R. V is R times I. If the voltage or the current are zero, then the other parameter is also zero. We can think of other examples that we've already seen in this class. For example, some resistive network. I've got a couple of parallel resistors here. I can combine those in parallel. They'll be combined as a 1.5 ohm resistor, which will then be in series with a 2 ohm resistor. And we said that this resistive network looks like something with an equivalent resistance of 3 and a half ohms. Okay? That defines the voltage current characteristic across these two terminals. Okay? So V is the equivalent resistance times I. So my voltage current relationship still goes through the origin. The IV curve has a slope of the equivalent resistance of this overall circuit which adequately describes this entire resistive network. In order to determine the characteristics at these two terminals, you don't need to know that there are these three individual resistors in there. You just need to know that there is some network which has some equivalent resistance. That's what our circuit reduction analysis technique was based upon. Likewise, let's take a look at a simple resistor with a source in here. This combination also has two terminals. It's a two-terminal network. I can look at the voltage across these terminals and the current into these terminals. Okay. This voltage, if the current is I, this is R times I. So taking a look at KVL around this loop, V is equal to V sub S plus R times I if I plot the voltage versus the current. If the current is zero, this V is V sub S. If I increase the current, the voltage increases proportional to the resistance. Okay? It turns out that this particular voltage current characteristic is extremely general for linear circuits. Okay? A straight line with some kind of offset voltage, you can represent virtually any linear circuit as that kind of two-terminal characteristic. Now, I told you about all those previous concepts so that I could tell you about Thevenin and Norton's theorems. Thevenin and Norton's theorems will rely heavily upon the idea of linear systems. They'll rely heavily upon superposition. They'll rely heavily upon looking at circuits as two-terminal devices. That doesn't mean that those concepts that I talked about are only useful in this context. We'll be using all those things throughout the rest of the class. The reason I rushed through them is because I want to get to Thevenin and Norton's theorems now. In fact, today I will show you Thevenin's theorem. I'll defer Norton's theorem to next lecture. Okay? Luckily, once we've done Thevenin's theorem, Norton's theorem is extremely easy to deal with. The general idea behind both of these is that we want to take some complicated circuit. Okay?
Now we have some linear circuit here to which we're ultimately going to connect a load. Okay? We want to be able to design this load, for example. Okay? If this circuit is extremely complicated, or in fact if it hasn't been designed yet, what we will want to be able to do is represent this complicated circuit as some simple circuit from the standpoint of the load. So we're going to replace circuit A, which has to be linear, with some simpler circuit, which will give the load the same voltage current characteristics at its terminals. So both circuit A and the load are two terminal circuits. We're going to connect them up here. Okay. Notice that there is no requirement that circuit B or the load be linear itself. Okay. This is the circuit we're going to replace using Thevenin's theorem. It's the one that needs to be linear. So as I said, the general idea is if there's a simple circuit here that provides the voltage current characteristics that this circuit is going to provide, it becomes extremely easy to design and evaluate the load without having to reanalyze a very complicated circuit every time you go through a design iteration. Okay, so ultimately what we're going to do is take circuit A of the previous slide, replace that with a simple circuit that has the same voltage current characteristics at its terminals. Okay, if the voltage current characteristics are the same, you can't tell the difference just by hooking up something to those terminals between a simple circuit and a complicated circuit. Remember, our equivalent resistance didn't matter. Okay, if you hooked up a circuit to a single resistor with equivalent resistance, it behaved the same as if you retained all the individual resistors that had that overall equivalent resistance. In order to do this, there are a number of requirements that you have to meet. Circuit A has to be linear. Okay, that's not a problem for us. All of the circuits that we deal with in this class will be linear circuits. This one's a little bit more problematic for us. You can have dependent sources in both circuits A and circuits B. What you cannot have is those dependent sources crossing the boundary between circuits A and circuits B. For example, circuit A can't have a dependent source that's controlled by circuit B. Circuit B can't have a dependent source that's controlled by circuit A. They have to be isolatable. Thevenin's theorem tells us that the linear circuit, circuit A in our previous schematic, can always be represented as a voltage source which is in series with the resistance. That is true regardless of how complicated circuit A in itself is. It will still have the voltage current characteristics of a source in series with a the resistance. Therefore, if we have a circuit A with some assumed voltage polarity at its terminals and some assumed current direction, we can take this circuit and replace it with a voltage source called VOC, more on that nomenclature later, in series with a resistance RTH. The terminal characteristics V and I between these two will be the same as long as VOC and RTH are chosen correctly. VOC is called the open circuit voltage. RTH is the Thevenin resistance. Now, looking at this circuit, we can see by doing KVL around this loop, the voltage across the terminals V is RTH times I plus VOC. Now, we can kind of see where the VOC, the open circuit voltage terminology, comes from. If these are open circuited, the current is zero and under open circuit conditions, V is the open circuit voltage. Okay, now on the previous slide we said that the voltage current characteristic for a Thevenin equivalent circuit is V is equal to the Thevenin resistance times I plus VOC. This graphically looks like this kind of voltage current characteristic. We have an open circuit voltage here, which is V when I is equal to zero. As we increase I, we increase the output voltage. It has a slope that is the Thevenin resistance. So a few notes on this. If you have a linear two-terminal network, its voltage current relationship can always be written in this form. Okay. VOC is the terminal voltage if I is equal to zero. If I have zero I, V is equal to VOC. 
a zero current implies that you're looking at an open circuit across the terminals. You're getting no current through the output terminals. That's why this guy is called the open circuit voltage. If I open circuit the two terminals of the circuit A, I will see the open circuit voltage across those terminals. RTH is the equivalent resistance seen at the terminals. It's called, as I said before, the Thevenin resistance. Okay, I'm now going to outline the process for creating the Thevenin equivalent of a given circuit. Okay, we're going to take some circuit and replace it with a voltage source in series with a resistance. The very first thing you need to do, and what is probably most problematic for new students, is to identify and isolate the circuit for which you want your Thevenin equivalent circuit. Most circuits that are given to you, at least at this stage, consist of both what I've called circuit A and the load circuit. Okay, so we'll give you an overall circuit, we'll tell you which part is the load, and we'll tell you that we want to determine the Thevenin equivalent of the rest of the circuit. So you need to identify the load and remove that, and then determine the Thevenin equivalent of the remainder of the circuit. To find the Thevenin resistance, okay, now you've got your two terminals where you're going to connect your load to later you need to determine a resistance looking into those terminals. In order to do that, kill any independent sources in the circuit. Don't kill your dependent sources. So you're going to short circuit any voltage sources. You're going to open circuit any current sources. Then you're going to calculate an equivalent resistance, the way we did when we were doing circuit reduction, by looking into the terminals that removal of this load left open. Now, the next step, make sure you reactivate the sources. One common error early on is that once people have killed the sources, they leave them off. Okay, that invariably leads to an open circuit voltage, which is zero. That's almost invariably wrong. So after you've found RTH, go back to your original circuit. Okay, put the sources back in. Leave the terminals open so that there's no current through the terminals that you opened up by removing the load. And analyze that circuit to determine the open circuit voltage. Now, this analysis can be done by any approach that you want to use. Mesh analysis, nodal analysis, circuit reduction, just applying KVL, KCL, and Ohm's law, etc. Okay, you're just doing a circuit analysis like we've been doing for the past nine lectures. After you've done that, typically the overall analysis you want to do includes the load that you removed in step one. So after you've got your Thevenin equivalent circuit, reattach your load and determine what you were originally supposed to determine when you were given the problem. Let's do an example of applying Thevenin's theorem to a simple circuit. What we want to do is use Thevenin's theorem in this circuit to determine the voltage V1. What we're going to do is replace everything but this one amp source with its Thevenin equivalent circuit. And then once we've done that, we'll replace this current source and use that simplified circuit to determine V1. Okay. First thing we need to do is remove the load. We're removing this part. We want to find the Thevenin equivalent of everything but this. So we are determining a Thevenin equivalent circuit of a 4 ohm resistor in series with an 8 volt source. We've taken out this current source, so that becomes an open circuit. And then I have a 4 ohm resistor here. So now I want to look into these terminals and determine a Thevenin resistance, I'll also determine the open circuit voltage across these terminals. So the Thevenin resistance is created by killing the sources. So I'm going to short this voltage source. If there were any current sources in the circuit, I would open circuit them, which gives me a 4 ohm resistor. Here are my open terminals left by removal of the source. Another 4 ohm resistor. Determining an equivalent resistance in these terminals, these two 4 ohm resistors are in parallel. So 
REQ is just my Thevenin resistance, which is the product of the two 4 ohm resistors divided by their sum, which is 2 ohms. So the Thevenin resistance is 2 ohms. I'll pick up on the next slide and calculate the open circuit voltage. OK, now previously on the Earlier slide, I removed my one amp source and decided that this was the circuit that I wanted to determine a Thevenin equivalent circuit for. I've got the Thevenin resistance. What I now need is the open circuit voltage VOC between these terminals. So for this circuit, I need to find this voltage difference. I can use any analysis technique I want to do that. Um, I used mesh analysis last time. I think I'll use nodal analysis this time. If I do nodal analysis, let me take this as my reference voltage. Okay. Uh, if I short this, that means this is my only node voltage, V sub A. Uh, this is a constrained voltage, which is 8 volts. This voltage source says this is 8 volts above V sub R. So nodal analysis. says VA minus 8 over 4 ohms plus VA over 4 ohms is equal to 0. Let's see. So if I multiply through by 4, 2 VA is equal to 8. So VA is 4 volts. That's this node voltage. VA is referenced relative to this. VA is just VOC. Okay. So now I can take this circuit and claim that it can be modeled as a open circuit voltage of 4 volts in series with a Thevenin resistance, which I already said was 2 ohms. that will give me the same voltage current characteristics at the terminals as this does, regardless of what load I hook up to it. So I need to reintroduce my 1 amp current source and determine the voltage across this. So this is my V1. Okay, so if this is 1 amp going through here, this becomes 2 volts. So V1 is equal to 2 volts plus 4 volts. V1 is 6 volts, which is what we originally wanted to determine. That concludes lecture 10. Next time in lecture 11, we'll do some more examples of Thevenin equivalent circuits. We will also introduce Norton's theorem. Equating Thevenin's theorem and Norton's theorem will allow us to do something called a source transformation, which we will also start to introduce in Lecture 11, but we'll probably spill over into Lecture 12 with finalizing that stuff.